I'm delighted that um, we can now proceed uh, to, um, to a terrific conversation uh, with somebody who probably doesn't need an introduction uh, based on the registrant's comments that we got. Welcome, Guy Raz, to authors and innovators. We're so pleased uh, that you're here. Um, and it's, um, we've had a terrific two days of conversation uh, around um, change, change makers, and how the future is now. So we'll we'll go ahead and have our staff unmute you so that uh, so that we can talk more about uh, how I built this, and I will um, I will tell you that uh, guy I know that um, you couldn't be here in person, but I want you to know that New England is just as you left it. Here at the Babson campus, we are enjoying a snowstorm, and we have about an inch of snow uh, on the ground. So. Uh, wherever it is that uh, that you are today, I suspect in the Bay Area or somewhere war somewhere warmer, um, it is a much better place than uh, than than it is here uh, along Route 128, uh, which I know you uh, you remember well. Well, guy, if we can get you to hit mute, uh, unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay, can you there hear me you now? Go. Perfect. Well, okay, great. Welcome. So, thank, so, uh, thank, so pleased to see you and uh, so happy to, uh, to talk about how I thank built you. this at our fourth annual Authors and Innovators. Um, Guy doesn't need any introduction, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it a little bit of justice for those folks uh, who don't know. Guy Raz is the host, co-creator, and editorial director of three NPR programs, including two of its most popular ones, the TED Radio Hour and how I built this. Both shows are heard by more than 14 million people each month. And I know Guy is also the creator uh, and proud co-host of NPR's first ever podcast for kids, Wow in the World. Um, how I built this, uh, of course, is one of my favorite uh, podcasts. It's about great invent innovators, uh, entrepreneurs, and idealists, and the stories behind the movements they have built. Guy has now um, taken all of his greatest hits. Uh, I think uh, Jennifer Hyman uh, talks about this uh, from Rinse and Runway in, in the book and said, you've, you've now turned all of your greatest hits into a how-to manual. And it's a, it's a terrific one. Guy, from you, I want to take you back to sure. um, Brandeis. Uh, so you go from Brandeis, you spend some more time getting a degree in history, you spend time as a Neiman Fellow, you then spend time covering wars. How does a guy who's a serious historian and journalist end up being the guy who chronicles business stories i have no idea <laughs> it's it's um you know it wasn't a plan you know i i i always wanted to be a journalist i was a student journalist um i loved journalism and i loved reporting but you know what i realized larry early on in my career as a reporter because i had I, I was very very fortunate early in my career i started in 1997 at npr and by the year 2000 i was the bureau chief in Berlin. I mean, it was kind of a crazy meteoric rise that that then um, then precipitated a meteoric crash uh, later on, but that we can, which we can come to. But um, at a very young age, I was, um, you know, very lucky and I was able to be overseas for six and a half years as a, as a reporter, um, first with NPR and then with CNN. And I was able to, to travel and, and report from 50 countries. I covered four wars. I mean, the Iraq war and Afghanistan and Israel, Palestine, and wars in the Balkans. Um, but you know what I what I realized fairly early on in my career was that I I I, I was never going to be able to outcompete the best reporters at the kinds of things reporters are rewarded for, which is breaking news and investigative stories. That wasn't really what what drove me and what 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 I was passionate about. What I was passionate about was showing up in a village in Iraq and meeting a family and telling their story and, and giving my listeners a, a, a window, you know, into the world of that war through their story. And that is how I reported overseas. You know, that's really how I began to kind of build the style that, um, that I have, which is to, to, to tell stories and to offer, big ideas, advice, inspiration, whatever you want to call it, but through the prism of, of somebody's own story. Um, and that's so, so the journey from being a reporter and, and, and doing what I do today is actually, I mean, even though it would have been surprising, had you told me 15 years ago, I would be 
you know, creating programs around business issues and, and entrepreneurs, it actually isn't that incongruous when you think about it, because one, you know, the, 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 the core, the foundation of my career really began in, in a form of storytelling. And that's basically what I do today. And, and that's how you start the book, which is so compelling. You talk about Stacey Brown from um, Chicken Salad uh, Chick uh, and how that moved your wife, Hannah, so much that yeah. you had that gotcha moment. Yeah. I Talk mean, I, about that. I love Stacey so much. I mean, here's a crazy thing, Larry. You know, as a journalist, you're trained to be distant from the, the subject that you interview and kind of be the voice of God. And I don't consider myself to be a journalist anymore um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the reality is when I interview somebody now for how I built this, I am telling their hero's journey, their life story about how they built a brand. And that could be Howard Schultz or Richard Branson or Stacey Brown or Jamie Siminoff of Ring or Sarah Blakely of Spanx, all of whom have been on the show. I interview them for three, four, five hours sometimes. I just got out of a five hour interview yesterday with the founder of Jazzercise, Judy wow. Shepard Missette, an incredible, inspiring woman. She revolutionized aerobics exercise in the US. Now, if you interview somebody in an intimate setting for five hours and you are asking granular questions about their life and you really are trying to understand it, there's no way you can't walk out of that having developed some kind of bond with that person. And Stacey Brown is an example of that. You know, she was a single mom. She her her ex-husband left and she was um, on her own with a six year old, a th three year old and a one year old. She had not had uh, any work experience because she stayed at home with the kids. She was a graduate of Auburn University. She was living in Auburn, Alabama, and she needed to make money. And she started to make and sell chicken salad to teachers at teachers' lounges, PTA meetings, door to door from an ice chest. And at, at a certain point, a friend of her said, this chicken salad is terrific. Why don't, why don't I help you open a little shack? You know, We can maybe make a luncheonette. And then the rent was like 500 bucks a month. And I don't want to give away the whole story because you can right. hear it on how I built this or you can read about it in the book. But it is a story of extraordinary, extraordinary triumph and extraordinary loss and devastating sadness and personal tragedy. But also, I mean, an amazing I mean, today that business is a hundred million dollar business. It's called Chicken Salad Chick. It's one of the fastest growing food, fast casual chains in the South. And it all began out of an ice chest uh, from a woman who had no experience in business and was left with nothing. And it's an incredible story. And I, I encounter these stories again and again and again, every single week we put out an episode of how I built this. And, and you can, uh, you can feel your passion for these folks. And, and I liked that you started in the book with, with the premise that look, entrepreneurship is not natural. And you answered the basic question that so many of our viewers, uh, more than 300 of them today, Guy, um, are, are asking, where do I find good ideas? You talk about so many good ideas in the book. Where do I find a good idea? Yeah. And, and let me clarify this idea because I think it's an important point you make about entrepreneurship not being natural. The natural state of humans is to avoid risk, is to avoid danger, right? That's why we are here on this planet because we saw the saber-toothed tiger and we, we went, went the opposite direction. And, and starting a business is like charging the saber-toothed tiger. I mean, you are basically saying, okay, I'm going to deal with rejection, the possibility of failure, maybe financial c collapse and catastrophe, you know, all the things that we're wired not to do as humans. So, um, so becoming an entrepreneur takes a lot of work and, and, a, lot of, um, and a lot of practice. And, um, you know, I have come to the, 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 the belief and the realization over the last five years of really um, diving into the world of entrepreneurship and studying entrepreneurs um, and, and realizing that it is something that is learned. It is a, these are a series of traits and skills that we all have the capacity to learn. Now, to your question, when it comes to ideas and finding good ideas, look, in some ways, this is the easiest part about starting a business. You have an idea, it's exciting. You talk about it with everybody you know. You imagine your product on the shelves of Walmart. Um, but then comes the hard part. You got to have a business plan. You've got to find investors. You got to find out what factories you can produce this product in. You've got to figure out a marketing and distribution um, uh, 
uh, strategy. I mean, it's a, it's it's very complex and a series of problems to be solved, which is what makes starting a business so exciting. But you know, how how do people come up with ideas? The answer is fairly simple. I mean, not coming up with an, a good, coming up with a good idea is not easy, but but the concept of it is relatively simple. It is you are I trying to identify a problem out in the world that you have that you need to solve that will solve it for yourself and for lots of other people. So if it's a problem that just you have, you know, you remember the um, the movie The Jerk with Steve Martin? Oh, sure. He, he, he solved the problem that he had, which was, um, you know, he pulled off the glasses. I can't remember what it was called, you know, with that little, but not a problem most people have. Most people are perfectly happy doing that with their glasses. You need to solve a problem that you have and lots of other people have and, or, or, or improve on a service or a product that's out there that you know can be made better. And that's essentially what a business is. And, you know, for many of the people I've interviewed, it, it comes in, in, in sort of moments of of searching of you know um, a great example is the story of away suitcases jen rubio who um, is a wonderful entrepreneur brilliant entrepreneur was working for a jeans company um uh and in in the uk uh, as a marketing person and she was really searching for a business idea she really wanted to start a business she had worked for warby parker as a social media director so she was already immersed in that world and she was um on a trip in Europe and uh, in the airport and carrying her suitcase with her and it began to break apart. And that was her aha moment. When she got back to New York, she started going to TJ Maxx and Marshalls and all of these stores looking at suitcases, buying them, examining them, starting to uh, research the industry. And she realized that in the suitcase market, there were you know, your standard suitcases that everyone buys at TJ Maxx or Target. And then there are the super high-end to me and Louis Vuitton bags that are so expensive, they're inaccessible. But there was no really well-made sort of moderate to high-end bag that was reasonably priced, that was within reach. And that was the genesis of what became Away Suitcases, which was you know last year valued at a billion dollars. So that's really how it happens. It's about keeping your eyes open and looking out for problems in the world that need to be solved. And you've got to be a bit of an optimist. You talked a bit uh, about rational optimism in your recent conversation with uh, the folks from Life is Good. How, um, well, how would you think about that? How would you, what would you say to our viewers today who say, gee, the world has changed. Uh, should I still do this? Larry, I am, optimism is a really, really complex idea, right? Because we don't want to be naive. <clears throat> We're living in a very difficult time right now. We're a week away from an election that I think a lot of us have anxiety over and, and about how what's going to happen in the days uh, and weeks afterwards. Um, you know, we're, we're living at a time where a significant percentage of the American population, um, you know, believes that it, the other side is, is socialist or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's, it's a very, very scary time. Um, what I what I mean by optimism, and I'm inspired by by the Jacobs brothers, the founders of Life is Good, this idea of rational optimism, which means it, it, it's not that you can't be skeptical of things. It's not that you can't be suspicious of things or that you can't be worried about things, but it's that you have to be you have to essentially accept that the that any kind of pursuit, any kind of idea that's worth that's worth putting out into the world um, is if it's worth doing, it will take time and you have be to, hard. you yeah. have to see far yeah. out, you know, it's like, it's, it's a cliche, but everything is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, and when it came, when it comes to the idea of optimism, you know, yes, entrepreneurs are optimistic about their ideas, but it doesn't mean that they don't have moments of self doubt. It doesn't mean that they don't have moments of lying on the bathroom floor, crying about whether this thing is gonna work or whether they can make payroll. I mean, that's also an important part of the process. You have to interrogate your idea. You have to interrogate your own assumptions all the time. It's really important. But ultimately, when you believe that the idea that you have is an idea that the world needs, that can be a really powerful force. I mean, I think about Tristan Walker and Bevel Razors. He's a he's an African American man. He knew that um, at, you know the moment he started to shave, that he would get painful razor bumps on his skin, and that's because men, mainly brown and black men, and men with very curly hair, when they're when you shave, 
your, 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 the hair grows right back into your skin. And he wanted to create a razor that would solve this problem for men of color. And he went to investors and met, most of those investors were white and they were sympathetic, but they, they didn't see this as a problem. They couldn't see it. They couldn't understand how this was a problem. But Tristan Walker knew. He knew there were tens of millions of men and women around the world who had this problem, who needed to, this problem to be solved. And it, it didn't matter that he heard a hundred no's or a thousand no's. He kept moving forward because he knew intuitively that if he couldn't solve that problem, nobody could. But he knew it was a problem that had to be solved. And that's what made him optimistic. That's what kept him moving forward. Rational optimism. Guy, I'm getting uh, bombarded from our viewers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you some questions. Um, I'm going to take three in particular. And you should know, Guy, that each of these folks will be receiving a signed copy of How I Built. Wow. <laughs> so awesome. our first question comes from Ashley Lucas from Babson College. Guy, the majority of entrepreneurs in the world will not grow their companies to be $100 million businesses. How do we communicate to individuals that building impactful startups, which may never make it big, is just as meaningful as building the ones that do? I love that question. Ashley, I, I want you to amplify that idea from the rafters, from the rooftops. It's so important. I, I look, how I built this is it, it's a realistic look at what it's like to build a business. But of course, we focus on huge companies, Starbucks and Ring and Virgin and, you know, Impossible Foods and Airbnb and Slack. Why do we do that? Because we're also a business and we want people to listen to the shows. And if it was a show that focused on a really great local grocery store, you know, our audience would be much smaller and it would be harder to, to have a, a scaled show with a, you know, which could be a sustainable business and could employ lots of people and do what we do. That being said, every time I have an opportunity to say this, I say it. The, the corner grocery store in your community that is profitable is a better business than Uber, which has never made a dime. OK, <laughs> right. Um, you know, many of these startups and unicorns have never made any money have never turned a profit. I think that attitude is starting to change now, especially in the VC world, where VCs are starting to say, you know what, maybe maybe this approach wasn't right. Maybe we need to start focusing on companies that are profitable. Um, you know, Dropbox is a great example. It was profitable from day one. Um, and, you know, there are lots of other consumer products, Jazzercise, I just interviewed, you know, I just said I've interviewed the founder of Jazzercise. They were profitable from day one. Um, and and they were lean and mean and and so i think that the idea of success isn't you know what what it a successful business isn't a massive scaled hundred million dollar billion dollar company it's a company that is sustainable that can sustain a person's life can can give you fulfillment can maybe employ one or two other people and give them sustainable lives my dad ran a very successful business. When he was 42 years old, he opened up a jewelry store selling pearls. He had no experience in this. He was an engineer. He had worked for defense contractors in Southern California, but he, he just he wanted to be his own boss and he decided to, to start selling pearls. Now, did he become a millionaire? No, he never, never made him rich, but he was able to raise four kids. He was able to employ seven people over the 35 years that he was in business. He closed it down. He didn't sell it to anybody. He didn't make a big, it was no payday at the end. He was left with merchandise that he had to liquidate, but he's retired. He was able to have a great life and uh, raise four kids. And that is, to me, that is that is the definition of, of a successful enterprise. Isn't, isn't that true? And, and this book is for them too. It's exactly for them. That's exactly who it's for. Our next question comes from Michael Welts, who's the CMO at Wasabi. And Michael asks, Guy, in 1899, the commissioner of the U.S. Patent Office said, quote, everything that can be invented has been invented. What do you think your guests would say about this prediction 120 years later? It's I love that so much. It's so cool. Um, I mean, we can you imagine 20 years ago, 15 years ago, if someone said to you, you know, we're all going to be walking through airports like this, like this. <laughs> right. You know. Um, or we're going to be walking down the street like this. I mean, I would not have been happy about that. I'm not happy about it. But the point is, is that we could not have imagined how smartphones, the iPhone in particular, has changed 
the way we behave, the way we, I mean, we have now a portal to infinite knowledge, right? In our, at our fingertips. You look at right now at the pandemic, right? This past year, and um, you look at what kinds of opportunities will come out of this moment. I mean, we can only begin to imagine, we can start to see the contours of that, of that future, right? Think about a brand like Zoom, which by the way, its stock price went from like $20 to $600 this year. So, you know, woe is me for not putting 10 bucks into that company. But, you know, Zoom, to, Zoom is to the pandemic. I mean, Zoom is to communication today what I think CompuServe and Prodigy were to the early internet. Now, it's good. It's just not good enough. It's not immersive enough. There are so many opportunities now to, to completely revolutionize um, you know, hybrid and also distant uh, vis virtual communications because that is going to be the future. It doesn't mean we're not gonna gather again. We have to gather. We are social animals. We need to be together. But what it means is that the future will be a lot more hybridization, especially as more people now realize they don't have to live in San Francisco or New York or Boston, expensive cities. They can live in Boise, Idaho or Omaha, Nebraska or Charlestown, West Virginia, which, by the way, will be really good for America to get that, you know, to a revert brain drain, to get smart people into these cities where they left for, for so long. So I think that we're going to see incredible innovation come out of this pandemic. How do we interact? How do we communicate? Um, how, you know, I mean, even you look at the real estate industry, I mean, it's, it's been booming this year, which is shocking, right? You would not, not have thought that that would happen. A lot of sales are happening through virtual tours. You know, right. the real estate industry has really pioneered the virtual home tour that has, has made it immersive and really allows you to feel what it's like to be in that home. Um, so I think there's so many opportunities in the travel and leisure industry, I mean, which have been really hit hard. How, what is travel going to look like in the future? How, are, and these are very small pit, you know, incremental innovations I'm talking about. We can't even begin to imagine what's going to happen with nanotechnology. You know, what's going to come out of biotech. I mean, the, the, the Nobel prize winner, Jennifer Doudna, who won it for CRISPR technology, right. We, you know, in a hundred years, we might be looking back at cancer and, and in the same way that we now look at, you know, bloodletting and leeches, right? Um, or, or giving somebody a swig of whiskey during the Civil War and, and amputating their leg, right? So it's, I mean, that idea, of course, is a wonderful quote, but of course, it's totally absurd, right? I mean, the, the, what, what will happen in the next hundred years will blow our minds if we could have that crystal ball today. Guy, Mary Belletza. Ask Guy, what was the single most important piece of advice that you received and followed that was critical to your success? Um, it's it's a great question. I received so much advice um, during my time. I think the most important piece of advice that I have have received um, and have really followed is listen. You know, my superpower is not my intelligence. I'm not I'm not more intelligent than you. Than you. I'm not you know, more connected. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just very curious. And that's a choice that we can all make. I think curiosity is much more important than intelligence. Because if you're curious, your mind is open, and you're willing to learn from everybody you meet. And that's, that's actually a piece of advice I got early on, which was, and, and I'm sure, sure you've heard a version of this, which is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. And, and every person you encounter is an opportunity to learn, you know, is an opportunity to grow to and, and I, I am who I am today because of the people I met in college and in, in and after that and before that and my wife and all these inputs, all these brilliant people. The music I listen to today heavily influenced by people I met in college, you know, the the ideas in my mind. So that's one of them. The other thing is listening. Listening is a superpower that we all have the capacity to develop. Most of us spend our time, too much of our time talking, but listening to somebody is honoring them. And it it's it can be one of the most powerful ways to develop a relationship, to convince somebody if you're having a debate, just by listening, by acknowledging their ideas, by actively listening and by asking questions, you know, based on the things that they're telling you. That's what I do and how I built this. And that is why I'm able to, to get people to really open up because really all I'm doing is using my emotional energy to listen to them. And that's been really valuable in my career. I want to talk a bit more about that um, and, and, uh, and have you talk about the 
active listening and authentic listening that you do, because I think it's it's one of the reasons so many of us listen to the podcast. I I read and I think I um, listened to you t- uh, tell Tim Ferriss on a, on a podcast that when people come on uh, or agree to come on, how I built this, you say to them, "I'm going to be. Uh, are you willing to answer anything? Are you willing to quote surrender?" And have you have you had folks who agree to that and then say, "I I, I I'm not sure I can do this." Well, I'm very careful at being very explicit in what I mean when I have a, a phone call with them. I want them to say no at that point. And because it's always these are always off the record conversations. I'm not going to tell you the people who have not agreed to come on the show. It's not many, but um, but but we part as friends. Um, I'm not there to embarrass them. I want them to understand that 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 how I built this and their story will not land in the same way, will not have the same emotional resonance and impact if it's a, 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 a you know, a, if they're plugging something or if it's a, a, a polished publicity event. It has to be real. It has to be authentic. The reason why, Larry, you listen to the show and I listen to the show, because I'm a listener too, is because I don't want to hear Howard Schultz talk about the success of Starbucks. I want to hear him talk about his personal anguish. I want him to hear him talk about his dad and his dad's you know, alcoholism. And I want to hear, you know, I want to hear people talk about moments when they felt alone and abandoned. And um, because that's when we connect with them. That's when we say, you know, holy smokes, like I am like Howard Schultz or Sarah Blakely or Tristan Walker. They're, they're like me. You know, I, I, the person who invented ring Airbnb, Uber, um, not Uber, um, Lyft, you know, um, they're, they have vulnerabilities too. And so that's, that's very important. I need that person to come onto the show willing to take us into their in, internal di, you know, dialogue or monologue. We're all, you know, we all live in our own movies. You live in your movie. I live in mine. All of you watching live in yours. That's consciousness. We walk around, we look left and right. It's our story, right? It's our point of view. I'm, what I'm trying to do on the show is get a seat in the cockpit of that person's brain, kind of like in Star Wars, you know, or Star Trek, and bring you along with me. You're in the passenger seat with me, all three and a half million of you. Really, you are. And we're trying to see your story and your flaws too, because your flaws are part of what make you you. No one is perfect. And the whole point of how I built this is to show that these people that are so successful and have done so well in business are just like you. They're imperfect. They're flawed. They made a lot of mistakes, a lot of stupid mistakes, but they worked really hard and they got really lucky and they persevered. And you're telling their story, which um, which is so much better than simply lecturing. Um, and that's what I like so much about how I built this. So what is next? Is there, um, is there a person or uh, is there an industry that you say, I've really, I got to dig into that. I haven't quite done that show yet. What's next, guy? Yeah, I mean, one of the industries that we really have not done is gaming, um, in part because, look, Larry, I'm 45. I'm not a gamer. I played Nintendo when I was a kid, but <laughs> it was never my thing. My kids are obsessed with it. My kids drive me crazy, and we have a lot of debates about screen time. And our debates is, is polite. Arguments, drag down. <laughs> right. um, but my kids love games, and gaming is a huge industry. You know, it's kind of passed me by, and I have really neglected that. So we are actually going to do an episode about a company that um, was a major force, is a major force in gaming called Riot Games. They invented League of Legends. There are really three video games that have revolutionized um, gaming in the last 20 years. It's it's War, World of Warcraft, League of Legends, and Fortnite. And, um, and those are three different companies. So we are profiling the founders of Riot Games to really kind of delve into that world. And and I admit in the interview, you'll hear it when the podcast comes out in a couple months, that I'm a, you know, I, I'm going to ask questions that make me sound like a complete idiot. But um, <laughs> these guys were so patient with me and, and explained the intricacies and the details. It's a very complex industry. It requires a lot of startup capital, uh, but a really interesting industry and a really interesting story with with those guys. So gaming is certainly one area that we will um, we will start to, to to look at. But be but but rest assured, if you're not into games, it's not going to be all games all the time. We're going to, you know, <laughs> we're sprinkle it in every now and again. Guy, who do you want to read this? I want people who are I don't want people who only are thinking about starting a business or only 
starting a business. I want this book to be read by anybody who is who, who, who wants to learn how to think entrepreneurially, because I don't believe you have to hang a shingle out in front of your door to be an entrepreneur. You can work at Babson College and be entrepreneurial. You can work at Disney. You can work at NPR, you know, Apple computers. I mean, Apple, uh, Apple, I mean, Apple computers. I mean, Johnny Ive invented the iPhone inside of Apple. I mean, who's going to say he's not entrepreneurial? It's a mindset. And I want this book in, in some ways is inspired by Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. I want people to think about entrepreneurship as a mindset, as a way of thinking and a, and a sequence of tools that you can pull out from your, your brain toolbox to make you more effective, to make you a better collaborator, colleague, um, you know, to think more creatively, to solve problems, whether you're working inside a big organization or you're doing it on your own. This book is really designed to be a cheerleader and the kind of book that you can pick up, especially when you're feeling down, when you're feeling beaten down and you can open it up and you can say, OK, I got this. Well, as I said in the Boston Business Journal, I got it and read it in one sitting. It's everything and more. Uh, Guy Raz, thank you so much. The book is How I Built This. The Unexpected Paths to Success from the World's Most Inspiring Entrepreneurs. Please get it from your independent bookseller, our sponsor, uh, Wellesley Books. And um, uh, Guy, thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing you and hearing you on how I built this in the future. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much.